Mr. Dedimore and Mr. Uh -oh, and Mr. Go ahead and do the coaches again because the recording guy. Um, our coaches are Mr. Dedimore and Mr. McBride. Wonderful. It's nice to meet them, and I hope they're all along for the ride with us. Let's do, you may have heard this already. We're going to do number one again with you, if that's all right. Question one. Y'all don't look the least bit bothered by that, which is <laughs> And just for the recording's sake, I'll read it very quickly. Here we go. Question one, unit three. The right to vote was not expressly included in the U.S. Constitution of 1787. In your opinion, was the implied right to vote in the Constitution sufficient for the creation of a representative democracy? How did the expansion of voting rights affect the evolution of democracy in our country? And give examples. And here we go, which is the greater threat to democracy, disenfranchisement or fraud, and explain. Not that there is any threat, you understand that, but if there was, what would it be, right? You ready to go? Take over. The right to vote is implied in Article 1, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution with the establishment of rules for electing representatives. We believe that a true representative democracy has political equality with equal access to voting for all citizens of a proper age. The implied right to vote failed to uphold this democratic principle by not establishing a federal standard for voting rights. The failure to create a federal standard guaranteeing citizens voting enabled a blatant denial of suffrage. It also allowed for state revocation of citizens voting rights like New Jersey rescinding previously established women's suffrage in 1807. With an established right to vote, the Constitution would have better ensured political equality, creating a far more representative democracy. However, we believe that the failure to create a representative democracy was purposeful. At the 1787 Constitutional Convention, Delaware's John Dickinson feared the dangerous influence of those multitudes without property and without principle. This is characteristic of the framers' intent to establish a government that would keep elites in power. Additionally, the structure of the framers' government hinders representative democracy. The framers established the Electoral College in Article 2, Section 1, and left the elections of the Senate to state legislatures in Article 1, Section 3, removing federal elections from the people to ensure that the government remained dominated by an elite body. Our unit believes that the expansion of voting rights has been a major facilitator of American democracy by increasing government responsiveness and expanding political participation. However, the effectiveness of these changes relies on societal support. By enfranchising more of the population, the government is forced to respond to and accommodate a larger group. Past voting expansions have upheld this idea. For example, the Equal Rights Amendment was proposed just three years after the 19th Amendment granted suffrage to women in 1920. Voting expansions have also led to more accurately diverse political participation by increasing the voter base. For example, just before the Voting Rights Act of 1965, there were only six Black representatives, but just two congressional cycles later, there were 13 Black representatives and one Black senator. A government is most democratic when it properly reflects the people it serves. However, suffrage expansions rely on societal acceptance to be effective. Despite the 14th and 15th Amendments' expansion of suffrage to all men in 1868, less than a quarter of Black men voted in the 1960 presidential election. It was not until the Civil Rights Movement increased public support that these numbers improved. Voting rights expansions are effective progressors of democracy when welcomed by society. Our unit believes that disenfranchisement is a bigger threat to democracy than fraud. Despite exaggerated claims of individual voter fraud, it is currently a minor threat. The Associated Press found less than 475 instances in swing states during the 2020 presidential election. Furthermore, we believe that the exaggeration of voter fraud is itself a, thro a threat to the perceived legitimacy of American democracy. Disenfranchisement, both directly and indirectly, is the greater threat to American democracy. Direct disenfranchisement, which explicitly limits the right to vote, persists today. The Sentencing Project reports that 5.2 million American felons were denied suffrage in 2020. However, most modern disenfranchisement threats occur indirectly. For example, Kansas House Bill 2183 criminalizes those who seem to be imitating an election official, effectively shutting down voter registration drives. As more states enact similar policies, people face barriers to the voting rights that are essential to American democracy. We believe that Congress should use its authority to regulate congressional elections granted by Article 1, Section 4 to a greater extent. 
For example, by passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act of 2021, which would establish a new preclearance requirement for state voting laws to limit the implementation of discriminatory practices. Thank you. We are now ready for your questions. Thank you. That was the civics lesson you just took us on. Thank you very much. Judge Talbot, you want to try them out? Sure. Um, can you tell us um, what the effect of gerrymandering has been and how the Supreme Court has addressed that issue? I think gerrymandering has been an extreme threat um, to the representation of Americans in their government. Um, and I think the Supreme Court in the past has agreed um, to a large extent and even extended it to the fact that gerrymandering may be limiting the right to vote. For example, in the case Go Million v. Lightfoot of 1960, the Supreme Court ruled that a congressional district that discriminated against African Americans violated the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed the right to vote to men of all races. Although I agree with Anna's point, I would also go as far as to say that the Supreme Court hasn't done enough to protect um, the issue of gerrymandering. In the case of Rucho v. Common Cause in 2019, it said that the court cannot rule on case it on um, it because it's a political uh, question and it's actually a thing that's very important to continue looking at. And if the court took a strong stance on it, it would be able to prevent um, it from continuing. And the reason that we believe that the courts should play an active role in um, gerrymandering is because um, we believe in the one person, one vote doctrine that was um, upheld by the Supreme Court in both Westbury v. Sanders of 1963 and Baker v. Carr of 1964. Um, Westbury v. Sanders refers to um, the principle that um, one person, one vote um, is both inherent to the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment, as well as um, Article One, Section Two. Judge, you good? All right, Susan. I'm going to change this up a little bit. Uh, I live in a state where, frankly, a lot of people don't vote, although they are registered voters. If do you consider that a problem when registered voters don't bother to show up at the polls? And is there a way, if it is a problem, that you think you might be able to solve it? Yes, I do think this is an issue because everybody should be able to exercise the right to vote. But one of the reasons why people do not show up to the polls is um, a study by the Bipartisan Policy Center in 2019 found that lower income um, neighborhoods have longer lines in their polling booths, which discourages people who cannot um, take time off of work to go to the polling booths. Um, to, uh, and I think a way to fix this issue would be to um, put more polling booths in these lower income neighborhoods so people have the chance um, to um, attend and not have to wait in these long lines. I agree with my unit mate Taylor, but I would also like to expand and say that voter apathy is a big issue. Um, just people who can vote choosing not to. And I think that this is um, partially because of the fact that voters don't feel represented in their government. They don't feel like their vote means anything. For example, 84% of Californians uh, who said that they did, chose not to vote said that they did so because they felt that their vote uh, meant nothing. And so I think that to decrease voter apathy, one of the solutions would be to ensure that the government is listening more effectively um, to the people's voice. And this is tied back to many um, democratic uh, thinkers' perspectives on um, representative democracy and voter turnout. For example, in his 1863 work, Utilitarianism, John Stuart Mill um, argues that um, when a society is more democratic, people turn out and people will show up and participate more in their government because they feel that they have a direct connection um, to their political system and they're more excited about participating. Thank you. Well, this is interesting that after what you've just said, we've asked a couple of different states today, small states like Connecticut, uh, but then some states like Ms. Firestone's state, Indiana, that are moderate size about the effect the Electoral College has. Obviously, your 54 electoral votes are extremely coveted by any candidate for president. But then 84% of the people that didn't vote said they figured they were in the minority and their votes wouldn't count. If they did eliminate the Electoral College, and I don't expect them to do that, really, but if they did, would that help the people of California or hurt the people of California? 
I think that it would uh, help the people of California if we went with a solely popular vote based um, presidential system that heavily underrepresented uh, Republicans in California, instead of having all of their electoral votes go towards uh, primarily the Democratic candidate, as has happened in the past, they would be able to contribute their popular votes to the overall popular vote of the nation, therefore ensuring that their vote is heard even in a primarily Democratic state. And to preserve the framers' intention of keeping um, the power of the presidential election in the hands of the states, we look to the National Interstate Vote, Popular Vote Compact um, to um, allow states to make this decision for themselves. Several states have already agreed to this, and if they, um, if more states are on board, then they could collectively decide that the popular vote is the best way to elect the president, and this would both give the states the choice over um, the presidential election and um, allow political minorities to be heard to a greater extent. It certainly would, but if you put that on the ballot in California, it probably wouldn't pass, would it? If, if you're describing it right, and if the Democrats in California feel like their candidates going to get them, they would vote that down in California, wouldn't they? Probably. I believe that um, California would probably vote that down because we have a high degree of polarization in our nation where um, many Democrats in California, which have their stronghold, fear that they would lose um, a lot of their base because they believe that their political views are so... Um, sacred to them they don't want to risk losing political power as part as other parties in the united states i expect you're right i think you're right your honor uh can you tell us what amendment gave uh 18 year olds the right to vote and related to that do you think the uh, right to vote should be lowered to the age of 16. Yeah, so the 26th Amendment gave 18-year-olds the right to vote after they um, protested um, during the Vietnam War because they were being drafted. They wanted um, the voting age to be lowered. And I do believe that we should lower the voting age requirement to 16 um, because I believe that this would encourage um, civic um, education and engagement, in, like especially during high school. And um, the Center for um, American Progress found that pre-registration um, from ages 16 to 17 um, actually found that this was successful. And in Florida, it increased uh, youth participation in voting by 9%. So I believe that if we um, reduce the voting age to 16, we would see even more voter turnout among the youth. Well, I do agree with Sarah's point. I don't think it is necessarily plausible for 16 year olds to gain the right to vote um, today. As we've seen with expansions of suffrage in the past with the 15th, 19th and 26th amendment, it has come after these groups have um, almost proved a certain civic dedication, which I don't believe should be necessary to gain the right to vote. But as we've seen, you know, um, women proving uh, after the world wars, you know, they participated and 18 year olds after the Vietnam War. This is kind of a central factor of how we've seen suffrage expand in the past. I would actually add on to my unit mates point and argue that 16 year olds have proven themselves um, because in many states, 16 year olds are working. They are involved in heavily involved in their communities. They volunteer. <laughs> um, they work. Uh, a lot locally, and um, I know many 16-year-olds who are more invested in this community than those who have the right to vote, and I believe that 16-year-olds um, who have, well, all 16-year-olds should have the right to vote as a way to express themselves in their community. Uh, we talked earlier about gerrymandering. You, you're pretty negative on it, but are there any advantages for to gerrymandering? One advantage, one possible advantage to gerrymandering is with the implementation of majority minority districts, where a minority who might not have a voice in a separate district would have a, a voice um, within this majority minority district. But I believe that this can be um, kind of circumvented by implementing uh, multi member districts that have a proportionally um, apportioned representation to those. Um, Congress people, because then all of the people within that district, uh, according to the percentage of the vote, will have that percentage of representation within their district. Thank you. And of course, oh, go yeah. ahead. Okay. Go. 
um, the court has also ruled that in cases where um, a minority group would actually be protected by gerrymandering by putting them all in an area where their vote would be even more counted and they would be like properly uh, represented, then that case of gerrymandering is um, constitutional. How about that coming out even? Nice job. First, I want to begin by complimenting two people that aren't sitting at that table, Valerie and Charles. If Taylor is your daughter, uh, when I was do if I was doing a competition like this, my parents would have been scared to death to come see me. So the fact that you're here <laughs> is a compliment to her, I think that's a real compliment. What I suspect, Charles, is that you're the dad and Valerie's the sister, probably, is what the deal is. But, but, but we're glad that y'all are here today to listen to her and any other parents that are online. Your Honor, what do you think? Uh, I think you did a very nice uh, job. Uh, uh, I liked the, in your opening statement that you said that the framers' intent was to limit the role of the people. And if you look at the Constitution, the only place where there was was a provision for direct election uh, of the, by the people is the House of Representatives. If there's no direct election for the Senate originally. The president was through the Electoral College. Supreme Court justices are, are not chosen directly by the people either. So I, I think your point was uh, well taken. Um, I liked uh, the fact that in discussing gerrymandering, you mentioned um, the Rucha case and uh, Baker v. Carr and some other cases. Uh, you might have mentioned Shaw v. Reno, which uh, outlawed uh, racial gerrymandering. Uh, that's a, an important case. Um, you had some good uh, comments on why there's low voting turnout in terms of both apathy and long lines. One thing that you might have mentioned is that states like Colorado provide for mail-in balloting, and mail-in voting has allowed for a very high percentage of people to vote. Uh, in Colorado and some other states. Tell them how um, high. This is amazing. This is an amazing number. Tell them how high the turnout is in Colorado. Over 90% of eligible voters uh, voted in Colorado with mail-in voting in 2020. Um, so, um, and then I like the fact that you uh, not only identified the 26th Amendment for 18-year-olds voting, but uh, that you said you linked it to the Vietnam War protest, which is something that's true, but we hadn't heard before uh, from any team. Um, and that uh, I was interested to hear your various comments on lowering the voting age. Some people have said that uh, if you're old enough to drive, then you should be old enough to vote. So uh, uh, maybe in the future, there will be more places that allow 16 year olds to vote. So you had a very thorough and uh, information packed uh, presentation. I really appreciated it. Thank you. I also enjoyed our presentation, your presentation. I always enjoy presentations too. When people talk about New Jersey allowing women, also free men for that matter, the right to vote as long as they own property. And they didn't discriminate on them except for whether or not they had enough money or had enough property until 1807. And that was a federal government that required New Jersey to disenfranchised those people. Uh, but, but you also brought up Dickinson's comments at the convention, the Constitution Convention, and most definitely they did not want the, the rabble type to vote. You know, they were had just been living through Shay's Rebellion. They weren't terribly sure in Philadelphia that anybody would protect them if somebody decided <laughs> to rebel and come after them. Because they didn't, weren't sure that the state of Pennsylvania would have protected them. So you, you brought up a, a lot of things to think about. You obviously spent a lot of time and probably a lot of arguments with each other on these, uh, which is good because that's how you learn. Absolutely. <laughs> and you, know, you even brought up the Kansas, the Kansas statute that I'm not sure, has that passed? Or is that just proposed? It's in effect, yes. yes. It is yes. in effect, it has passed, okay. And I, I enjoyed our discussion back and forth very much. It was enjoyable and it was a job well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Well, I agree. It was obvious by your reaction that she was right about arguments among yourselves. We'd like to have seen that. I bet that was <laughs> <laughs>
I tell you something else I'd like to do, Judge Talman. I'd like to get the team from Connecticut that we just heard from, and this team right here, states from that disparate size and look them up on the tables and ask these questions and see if we could tell where they came from because I wonder <laughs> how different the answers would be. Obviously, the Electoral College answer might be a little different, but we might be <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, because what you see, you're going to get you're going to get a higher turnout, I think, if you take it away. Those that felt like their vote didn't count would come on out. Um, I just thought it was really good. What, what Susan said is right. You mentioned a number of things we either hadn't heard today or hadn't heard often enough. And I was very thankful for that. You are ob obviously well coached. And I hope you continue to stay in touch with your coach and have them have a continuing influence in your life. Because if you are this good on these subjects at this age, there's no stopping you. This was so enjoyable for us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, you so much. Thank you.